Well, throughout the year, we often get emails and tweets from you, our viewers, about the questions you want asked, and sometimes we ask them. But tonight, it's all about your questions, so let's get right to it. Andrew, Chantel, Bruce, and look who's joined us. It's a treat for me and a desperation for you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Brevity, Rex Murphy, is with Thank us here you, tonight. Sir. Let's start with our uh, very first question. came in by Twitter. It is from Charlie James. Are question period questions told in advance to government ministers? If not, how do they have answers ready to read? Andrew. Well, they're not told to them in oral questions. Uh, they do do a lot of preparation beforehand with their staff, uh, running through every possible question that could be asked. I think the really operative words in that question are, to read, and this is a nefarious practice that's crept into our parliament where ministers will read questions that have been written for them by, you know, possibly the staff and the PMO. As often as not, the questions will have been written out as well and read out mm -hmm. in parliament. And when you see them on the questions coming from the government side, you wonder whether the same person is writing both the questions and the answers, and it's just a dialogue <laughs> between them, in which case, let's cut out the middleman. We need to get back to people thinking on their feet and speaking in their own mind rather than just repeating things that have been written. Not a lot of jobs that won't be needed, Andrew. <laughs> it's not a time for getting rid of jobs. <laughs> Sean Town. They don't, they, they do have answers to read, but if you listen to, carefully to question period, they often don't have ready answers to read. And so they read inane, you know, it could say, it could say please bring milk home for dinner, and they yes. would read that. <laughs> uh, if that's all that they have to read, then I agree with Andrew. The notion that there's any to and fro, uh, it's very rare sometimes between leaders. Not every leader, uh, Thomas Malker is, is pretty good for th at thinking on his feet. Sometimes Stephen Harper, uh, ventures outside of his comfort zone, such as when he says it's crazy, crazy to uh, price carbon when the prices uh, of fuel uh, products is going down. You, you know, the, the other point of the question was, though, do, do they tip each other off? On Like, does the opposition tell the other side? And it, I think for the most part, no, but there will be on occasion. They will. Well, if it's really are, coming out of left field, that there are will, some will occasions happen. when that does happen. And sometimes it's opposition parties who want to make sure that they have an actual exchange about an important issue. So uh, they're not trying to help the government, but they are trying to make sure that ministers don't just stand up and say, let me take that question under advisement. The other situation, you don't see it as often now, but I remember it back in the days when Joe Clark was opposition leader was that if they wanted to psychologically shake up the government, they would signal that they were going to ask questions in a certain area. And I can tell you on the government side, uh, it would send you scurrying for information to see what scandal might be lurking underneath that general question area. And it was important to do. Back well, in the day, <clears throat> in the 70s, when, especially mm -hmm. when Elmer McKay would get up. That's right. Uh, they'd be shaking on the Liberal side, but that, that was <clears throat> many generations ago. <laughs> ago. Uh, next question comes in by video. Here it is. My name is William Doney, and I'm 13 years old, living in the town of Legal, Alberta. I would like to know how the dropping price of oil will affect Stephen Harper's election promises. This guy's going to be the next Andrew Coyne. <laughs> uh, Rex. Uh, as to what Mr. Harper would do with the prices of dropping oil and his promises, I would suggest at this stage he'd probably reduce the number of pro promises based on the price of oil. I think just as a, a, a kind of extrapolation of the question, the price of oil might be a much bigger thing in this election coming up than it would have been even three months ago. This is part of the equation of Harper, Trudeau, and the price of oil. That's going to play large. All right, Bruce. Well, again, I think on that question, it will depend on where oil settles out, assuming it reaches some sort of stability at some point. It's come down, what, 40% in a very short mm -hmm. period of time, which only means that it can be volatile in the other direction too, I suppose. Um, there will be an impact uh, on how all the parties campaign, and it'll have to do with what the expectations are for development of the oil sands, for the pipeline projects that have been discussed. Too early to tell what the impact will be, but for sure there will be one. All right, next question on video, here it is. I'm Jill Rafus from Halifax. Since a minority of Canadians are members of political parties, why don't more voters support independent candidates who promise to represent their constituents on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. This one sounds like it's kind of up your alley here, Andrew. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of disadvantages that independent candidates are at. She says, why don't they just vote on issue-by-issue -issue basis, which is great, but that means it makes it hard for people to know what that person stands for in advance. What the party label does is serve as a kind of a brand. Like when you go to an unfamiliar town, you're looking for a hotel, you look for the brand name, and it's helpful to people. 
Um, the other thing, of course, is independents don't have the money and they don't have the staff working for them. There are a lot of disadvantages. I don't think the choice has to be between the kind of rigid party discipline that we know, where everybody has to vote the party line almost all the time, and pure independence. But what we can do, I think, is give people within the party uh, hierarchy, within the party label, a bit more freedom to, to you know, on, on given issues to vote their conscience rather than the party line. Chantal? I think most voters are ready to accept that sometimes their MP will not vote exactly the way that their constituency would have if the party in power makes a demonstration that this is the right thing to do or the, the better thing to do. The best is rarely on offer when you're a politician. Uh, and I don't see the advantage of voting for independent MPs who will vote and have no voice around any table and will not shape uh, what the, the, the vision of the government or, the, or a party is. So uh, I'm not sure that it would be terribly efficient. All right. Next question. And this one uh, came in by email, I believe. Here it is from uh, Axel Kraus in Castlegar, BC. Coalition governments work well in other democracies, particularly in Europe. Why won't Trudeau and Mulcair talk about a coalition to oust Harper? Why is coalition a dirty word in Canada? Bruce. Well, I'm not sure it's a dirty word, um, but I don't think that we'll know whether or not it's something that's of interest to any parties until after the outcome of the election. I think there was a pretty serious effort to form a coalition government before. So we do have politicians who, who sit in Parliament who are familiar with the idea and willing to embrace it in certain circumstances. But at the end of the day, it requires two parties that feel that they can each benefit uh, and not lose face or not put too much at risk by doing something like that. And as I say... I think both the NDP and the Liberals right now both see better advantages in campaigning on their own. Right. There's a couple of reasons. <clears throat> it's interesting that the question is phrased the way it is, that why don't uh, Mulcair and Trudeau get together and form a coalition? It's because the, the animosity towards Harper in both parties is put at a different pitch. And secondly, the interests of the Liberals and the NDP, even though it's not, it's not kind of acknowledged in the question, are really fundamentally opposed. I would think now the real... The real blood battle going on here is actually Liberal and NDP because one or the other has to get out of the way if they have a hope of defeating the dread Demogorgon that presently occupies 24 Sussex. And I'm being brief. The dread, <laughs> the dread which? Demogorgon, yeah. an evil demon underground. Very good. No, I was just checking to see if you... <laughs> I thought you were. Of course I knew. Of I just want to make every, sure you knew. Everybody, everybody knew. <laughs> Next question is uh, on video. Here it is. My name is Mike DeRosenroll and I live in Bombay, Victoria. My question for the panel is, should there be a code of conduct for members of parliament, along with an independent office to oversee compliance and respond to complaints? Or should such incentives even be necessary to encourage righteous behavior and basic truthfulness on the part of our members of parliament? Nice question, but did he have to rub it in about the bombing? Part of Victoria? <laughs> Looking pretty good out there. He's Andrew, sad. what about the answer here? Well, I, I think there is a code of ethics, but if he's talking about sort of a broader conduct of, you know, don't, don't behave like boors and, and rapscallions or whatever, to use a, a Rex word perhaps, <laughs> uh, I think the enforcer of that is the public. I mean, that's, that's uh, if people are behaving badly, this, this gets noticed and eventually it will catch up with you uh, uh, at, at, at the electorate. I think there's a larger issue for the party leaders, in my opinion, which is that we've go, we go through election after election where people run on one promise and then do the diametric opposite once they get elected, the most recent being Pierre, uh, Pierre in, in Quebec uh, with the, with the, the price of uh, the daycare. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the problem with that particularly is it means that we don't believe any of them anymore, and I think we've got a real issue where somebody who wants to be believed now people are going, oh, you're just a liar like all the rest. And I think we've really got to address that. Rex. Well, uh, you know, on that question, the code of conduct actually has to be in the system as it is. This is almost, in logic, that infinite regress. The members of parliament are a, a chamber. They are a, a body of adjudication. They're also publicly elected MPs. So their conscience has to be a higher grade by the application of their, of their own virtue and morals. The idea of postponing it or pushing it out further is wrong. And th the second thing, and this goes back to another question you had, if individuals within the parties made themselves, just by self-declaration, I'm going to be a kind of patrol officer of when some of our guys get out of line, not the other side, because everyone hates the other side. And I'll do either backstage sh uh, chats with these people or gently remind them that we have a civil image to represent as well as the constituency. Isn't that what whips uh, partly do, though? Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, if a, a member is out of line, they would 
call this member in and say, we're hearing these things. They may not be true, but if there are, so these things do happen. In the end, though, uh, this isn't a, you know, a boarding school with a principal waiting. Uh, and like Andrew, I find the broken promises more shocking than the, the behavior of MPs who, by and large, do behave and work hard. All right. We've only got a couple of minutes before we take a break, so let's try and get a couple more questions in, uh, starting with uh, this one came in by uh, video. Hi, my name is Barry Friel. I live in Ottawa. My question for the panel is as follows. What impact do you anticipate Aboriginal leaders in Canada having on the 2015 federal election? Bruce, you want to try that? Yes, it's a, it's a very good question. It's a very interesting question. Um, I do think that the question of a direct impact, I think, is uncertain at this point. I think the question of uh, how Aboriginal communities are involved in important economic developments is, is potentially going to take on more importance, already is to some degree, uh, than has ever been the case. Um, the reason I'm a little bit hesitant about whether or not I think there will be direct impact is it's not clear how the leadership of those communities are going to participate or not in electoral campaigns. And it's also not clear exactly what solutions might work. And so politicians are more interested in finding uh, solutions, I think, generally. But um, the more interested they are doesn't mean that it gets that, e that much easier to figure out exactly how to solve for some of the challenges. But if you want your issues on the radar, and that's true of any group, younger voters, families, you go out to vote. Uh, and you encourage people of your community to go out to vote because if there's one thing politicians understand, it's people who vote who could actually make the difference between a defeat and a victory. All right, right. last one before the, uh, the break. Here it comes. It came in on Twitter, and it is from Jordan Sinclair in Ottawa. How much ground does Trudeau have to gain in the election to keep from having his uh, Liberal Party of Canada leadership questioned? Rex. Oh, I think if he had a single sod, he would, he would not have his leadership question. Uh, question. Uh, Mr. Trudeau was there for two terms if he chooses to have them. If he loses the election but moves up to second rank, he's still there. But what he has to do is not a matter of gaining ground. <clears throat> he has to complete this jump over Mr. Mulcair and the NDP. That's, that's the real test of the election coming up. And at this point, we've seen a nice combination. The external issues, the terrorism in Ottawa, those forces have somewhat redeemed Harper's standing in the last little while and shown that the world is, in inverted commas, serious place. Mr. Trudeau's challenge really is, it's the old word, he's got to put more substance. The high school speeches have got to stop and the platitudes have got to be ended. Chantel? I totally agree. Uh, I think uh, that his leadership is safe uh, as long as he manages to bring the Liberals over the NDP, even if he doesn't win power. But... I don't uh, preclude that this leadership would be in danger if he has a disastrous campaign and what Rex talks about becomes a 40-day uh, gong show. All right. We've got to take that quick break I was talking about, but when we come back, more of your questions, including this one. Why don't we have impeach laws for the prime minister, ministers, or the mayor? Welcome back to our Your Questions edition of At Issue. Andrew, Chantel, Bruce, and Rex are all here at the table to handle this next question. It's on video. Hi, I'm Renee Beauchamp. I'm from Toronto. And my question for the panel is, why don't we have impeach laws for the Prime Minister, Ministers, or the Mayor? All right. Impeach laws. Bruce, you start us. Why don't we have those? Well, I can understand why somebody having experienced some of the politics of Toronto perhaps may have, uh, may be wondering that kind of thing. But I, I guess from my own standpoint, um, I can see the merit in theory, but in practical terms, I think we're still better off on balance having elections to decide who we want. And we do have some mechanisms within how our parties operate that can, that can deal with extraordinary situations. There's always a little bit of risk. Once you start putting in place uh, laws that allow you to jerk the chain of politicians a little too much, is that you end up creating a syndrome that you think might be a good one, but it actually is counterproductive. There is, like, recall legislation in some areas, is there not? In some provinces, yeah. yeah. I, I, the, but the impeachment for, for prime ministers is that they lose the confidence of the House. A prime minister, unlike a president, has to command the confidence of the House every single day when he goes in there. 
And at any given moment, in theory, he could be voted out if people were tired of him. The reason why the United States has an impeachment procedure is precisely that. The, the president is independent of the Congress, and this is, it requires this extraordinary procedure to bring him down. I agree with Bruce that in the specific case of, of the mayor of Toronto, I think they did discover that they had created a system where there was no way to remove somebody who had really so <coughs> blotted his copybook, but who anticipated that kind of behavior? You're talking about David Miller now, are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you. Talking about Rob Ford, of course. Yeah. Uh, David Miller was, was dealt with with the public at the appropriate time. Rex. Actually, slight disagreement. I was in Newfoundland when uh, a political party, it's not the same thing as prime minister, it was opposition, but it's happened to premiers too. <laughs> if the caucus, for reasons that are fairly strong and justified, if a leader is extremely careless or doing all sorts of other kinds of things. If a caucus turns against a leader, that's not in the Constitution or articles of whatever it is, but he or she can be ejected. In fact, we're floating leaders down in Newfoundland now, but one a day. Uh, <laughs> the second thing is, uh, this is not quite the parliamentary reach or the election thing. We have in this country the, the criminal laws. And when our politicians really get out, of, get out of trouble, once they hit a certain zone, we might call it technically you're being impeached. But a lot of them get tossed out, where we see it both in Senate and in House of Commons. Chantal. Most of our politicians uh, end up having the good sense of resigning before they're handed out of office. But, uh, but you're seeing, without deciding who's right or wrong, you're seeing the mechanism of getting rid of a leader at play in Manitoba, yeah. where mm -hmm. the premier uh, has lost the confidence of part of his cabinet and now will have to submit to a leadership vote. So there are mechanisms yeah. in place, but if you went for an impeach law, I live in Quebec, I try to imagine the PQ rallying millions of signatures to get rid of a federalist government or vice versa. I figure the system is already difficult enough for governments who have to make tough decisions without a law like that. I agree. All right, here's a gr great question, but you're going to have to be very quick with your answers. Marco <coughs> Chioda sends this on Twitter. On Twitter, has any politician done anything to restore your faith in politics this year? Quickly round the table on this, Andrew. Uh, well, nothing would restore my faith in politics, but uh, uh, Michael Chong, I think, made a va valiant effort with the Reform Act. One conservative part of, MP. Conservative MP. One part of which was indeed to to regularize the process of bringing down party leaders, so it wasn't this kind of crazy Byzantine process that we go through right now. Um, he didn't succeed. The bill has been largely eviscerated, maybe even taken more in committee. But it was certainly good to see somebody out there, and I think he won a lot of points from people. Sean, Tom. Uh, nothing will shatter my faith in the political system and, and the democratic system that we have, so I don't wait for someone to restore it. But uh, this year, I found that uh, watching the shooting on Parliament Hill, politicians uh, were trying hard then to live up to uh, the dignity of their office, and that was a welcome sight. Right. I agree with that, but I have an individual to uh, throw into the mix. All of us will remember, of course, it's almost scripture in Ottawa, the entitled to my entitlements uh, by the brilliant Mr. Dingwell. Uh, there's an NDP MPP in Ontario who got elected. His name is Joel Semino. He was only elected five months and for various reasons decided to leave. He was entitled, there's a key parliamentary term, to $58,000 in severance. And unlike all the other bandits that do this kind of thing, he declined it and honestly left the stage. This will not repair politics, but it lights a little candle. <laughs> Bruce, you get the last word. Well, I don't. Uh, I have a lot of faith in politics, so I don't need something to restore that faith. But I, I do think uh, there are things that happen all the time the mo that that uh, that if people knew more about would give them more faith in politics. Uh, one of the recent ones, I think, was the unanimous uh, view of the House of Commons that it was a good idea to give more support to thalidomide survivors. Um, uh, I think it's an important issue and all parties came together on, all MPs came together on it. All right. Thank you all.